So you want to send people to space on your new spacecraft. Congratulations. Now, before you go and throw a crew on board and yeet them into whatever your definition of space is, there are some things for you to be aware of first. This video is brought to you by ineedmore.space slash shop. Hey everyone, TJ here from I Need More Space. Thanks a lot for watching. If you follow the variety of spaceflight programs in the US as closely as I do, you'll see the phrase human rated or human certified or crew rated thrown around a lot when it comes to systems that involve, well, us humans on board. I thought we could all use a refresh on what this means and why it's important. This video is only going to focus on the regulations around the United States Federal Aviation Administration's operator license with approval to carry a crew. I'm planning on a future video about the requirements around NASA crew launches, which are much more detailed and frankly, much more difficult and for good reason. A few contextual caveats that will help us stay focused before we proceed. I'm gonna assume your spaceport has the appropriate launch license, although explaining that process may need to be its own video in of itself. I'm only going to focus on the actual spacecraft people will go on, the immediate related systems around it, and the procedures required. I'm also gonna call the people on board these spacecraft crew just to keep it simple, regardless of their role as a crew member or spaceflight participant. When I cover participants, I'll make it clear. It's gonna be impossible to cover every detail in any meaningful way without making this video like three or four hours long. So I'm gonna cover the basics, so you just get the gist. I'm putting my source for the video in the description. So if I don't cover something you're interested in or you have more questions, you can look there or ask me on Twitter. I'm at TJ underscore Cooney. Also in 2023, much of what I'm going to cover in this video may change as it's when the FAA is allowed to update their regulations based on their learnings from past flights. So as I stated earlier, there are two main bodies that can approve you to launch people into space, NASA and the FAA. Figuring out whose license you need is pretty simple. Is your mission flying NASA astronauts? If yes, you need a NASA human rating and an FAA operator license with approval to carry crew. If no, then you just need an FAA operator license with approval to carry a crew. You might be saying, cool TJ, but what's an operator license? A launch operator license authorizes a licensee to conduct launches from one launch site within a range of launch parameters of launch vehicles from the same family of vehicles transporting specific classes of payloads. This license is good for five years from the date of issuance. A friendly reminder is that any American company that wants to launch rockets from anywhere in the world needs to have an operator license from the FAA. Full stop. This is why a company like Rocket Lab needs FAA licenses even though they're launching from New Zealand. They're an American company. So anyway, in this video scenario, your flight is not a NASA flight. Congrats, got a little easier. But before I can tell you about the FAA license you need, we should probably level set on who the FAA is and what the job is of their 48,000 employees. Safety is the number one priority. They regulate all aspects of civil aviation in the US, as well as the surrounding international waters in order to ensure anyone flying spacecraft are doing so as safely as possible, to protect people and property in the sky and on the ground. They develop the standards and enforce them to ensure spacecraft are safe to fly that pilots and mechanics are qualified, and that the people and systems that regulate the flow of air traffic do so safely. They also manage all U.S. airspace. Essentially, if you want to fly nearly anything over, from, or to the United States, the FAA will need to be involved. Spaceflight, though, is inherently much more dangerous activity than commercial air travel. And for that reason, the FAA is approaching it much differently. They're primarily concerned with public safety, which includes people and property on the ground rather than the safety of the crew, although they're important too. I'd like to pause here for a moment though, before we get to the weeds on regulations and confront the elephant in the room. There's a lot of dialogue out there on the internet about how the FAA slows down progress or should just let companies like you know who build their systems at will. Well, as the old saying in aviation goes, regulations are written in blood. These regulations and processes exist not out of a vacuum. They exist because property has been severely damaged or even worse, people have literally died or gotten hurt because of mistakes us humans have made, either willfully or ignorantly. Spaceflight and aviation have thousands of common denominators, and the FAA is taking what they've learned from risks in commercial and government aviation and applying them to spaceflight where those risks are only higher. Like, I hate to get morbid here, but like, could you imagine what would happen to the commercial crew marketplace if there was a loss of crew event this early in the process? 
it would shatter consumer confidence and set the industry back at best years, if not a decade. Not to mention the insurance premiums for those flights would increase, making an already very expensive endeavor even more so. It's in our best interest in the long term to be cautious, collect as much data as possible, and then amend the regulations as time goes on, which the FAA has thankfully proven to be willing to do. Okay, end of tangent, back to the script. The history of the FAA granting permission to fly people on non-NASA spacecraft starts with the Ansari X Prize of Spaceship One. It was their big debut of licensing people to go to space. Since then, the regulations have evolved as they've better understood how the business of sending people to space worked. The FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation issues a license when it determines that an applicant's launch or reentry proposal will not jeopardize public health and safety, safety of property, U.S. national security or foreign policy interests or international obligations to the United States. In order to get approval to launch crew, there are additional regulations a provider must adhere to in order to get that approval added to their operator license. This office doesn't only regulate commercial launches, but encourages and fosters the commercial launch industry. They like write papers and provide guidance to up and coming companies. They, they really want this to work. They want to help guide providers to launch payloads in, the, in a safe way in order to not jeopardize the industry as a whole. One bad egg could spoil the whole meal, if you get my analogy. There are several aspects a provider must fulfill in order to receive an FAA operator license with approval to carry a crew. I've grouped them into five categories to help us better understand them. Verification program, crew qualifications and training, smoke detection and fire suppression, environmental control and life support systems, and finally, liability waivers. Let's start at the top. Verification program. Before any human steps on board a spacecraft to fly to space, an operator must successfully verify the integrated performance of a vehicle's hardware and any software in an operational flight environment before allowing any spaceflight participant on board during a flight. This verification must include flight testing. Basically, the system needs to do a complete test in the same manner it would do with a crew on board an all-up flight test. The FAA recommends that you test the vehicle beyond its maximum operating environment. This should ensure that the design is sufficiently stressed to demonstrate the system performance is not degraded due to design tolerances, manufacturing variances, and uncertainties in the environment. Push the speeds, temperature, noise, vibrations, etc. We want to make sure that this sardine can is safe to fly. Next up is crew qualifications and training. The FAA has technically three kinds of categories for people that will fly in a spacecraft. You have your crew, you have a pilot who's part of your crew, and you have participants. Let's start the training from the simplest role to the most complicated. Participant. They are defined by the FAA as someone who is engaging in spaceflight as a paying passenger, but is not a member of the crew or launch provider. The FAA recommends that each participant is at least 18 years of age, and an operator must train each participant before the flight on how to respond to emergency situations, including things like smoke, fire, loss of cabin pressure, an emergency exit, etc. Think of this as similar to taking a flight on an airliner today. The safety briefs prior to your takeoff that teach you about your seatbelt, oxygen, emergency exits are required by the FAA. Airliners today are extremely safe and the passenger training is much more streamlined than ever. I'd expect participant training to get as streamlined as this as the industry evolves. Now back to your rocket. The level of training is left up to the discretion of the operator. Virgin Galactic, for instance, offers a three-day training for its crew with a focus on the participant's gear, communications and function, and the spacecraft cabin. Next up, crew. The crew is anyone on board that is not a participant. They're likely employees of the provider and play an active role in the spaceflight. An operator must develop a training curriculum and schedule for each member of its crew and define standards of success for completion, as well as continuing to update the training based on experience from past missions. This training will teach them how to carry out their role on board or on the ground, including emergency scenarios. Completion of each step of this training must be documented for each member of the crew. Each member of a flight crew must demonstrate through the training an ability to withstand the stresses of spaceflight, which may include high acceleration or deceleration, microgravity, and vibration, while safely carrying out their duties so that the vehicle will not harm the public. The training should put them through nominal and off-nominal scenarios, including abort and emergency scenarios. Finally, your pilot. This role is really only relevant to a vehicle that would be similar to Spaceship 2 as it's the only one currently flying with someone actively at the controls of the vehicle. All other vehicles are either mostly or entirely autonomous. The pilot is a member of their crew who has the ability to control in real time a launch or reentry vehicle's flight path. As a crew member, they require the same training as such, 
but they do have additional responsibilities. Have a FAA pilot certification with an instrument rating. Have the skills necessary to pilot and control a vehicle during launch or re-entry. Duh. Receive vehicle and mission specific training for each phase of flight through simulators, flying another craft with similar characteristics, or other appropriate hands-on training. Train and procedures that direct the vehicle away from the public in the event that the crew abandons the vehicle during flight. This again really targets an airdrop space plane system as no capsule launch abort system is going to allow a human to orient the vehicle. That's all baked into the flight software. So basically you know how to fly your spacecraft inside and out. Next up, we have smoke detection and fire suppression. An operator or a crew must have the ability to detect smoke and suppress a cabin fire to prevent incapacitation of the flight crew. Yeah, that's fairly straightforward. I won't dig into that further. Fire is bad. I think we all understand that. Piggybacking on the keep the crew alive theme, we have environmental control and life support systems. This one is actually pretty fascinating as it's more involved than most may think. The FAA requires atmospheric conditions adequate to sustain life and consciousness for all inhabitant areas within a crew vehicle. Two thumbs up from old TJ here. Consciousness is dope. This includes the following requirements. Backup oxygen supply for the crew in the event of the primary supply is compromised. The ability to control temperature, pressure, humidity, O2 and CO2 compositions, circulation and potential contaminants or hazardous gases. The final requirement here is having redundant means to either prevent cabin depressurization or in the event of a depress, have a plan to keep the crew capacitated. This is likely achieved with using redundant the similar methods to keep the cabin airtight or making the crew wear a pressure suit. Or you could just be really safe and do both. Finally, the lawyers get to have a word. Liability and waivers and notification of risk. The long story short is that anyone involved in the operation, oversight and licensing of this rocket system wants to wash their hands of any potential liability in the event that things went south for the crew. As the overused saying goes, space is hard. Both crew and participants need to be informed in writing that the vehicle is not certified by the US government and they must sign a waiver releasing any potential claims against the US government or FAA prior to each flight. If you'd like to read this waiver, super fun, link is in the description. All participants on your flight also need to be notified in writing about the risks of the launch and re-entry, including the safety record of the vehicle they're flying, as well as all other space vehicles. The FAA also wants everyone on board to understand that this is not a zero risk scenario and the liability solely falls on those participating in the experience. For employees of the operator, I'm sure they have insurance policies in place to take care of them in the event things don't go well but a policy for the participant would need to be acquired outside of the operator providing the flight. So it's not that you can't get coverage, space insurance is offered all the time, but it's likely not gonna be offered through the launch provider. I know this probably seems like a lot of rules and regulations and some of them are pretty duh, like you gotta be able to breathe on your spacecraft, but still it's important to have these written down and I expect in 2023 to these regulations to evolve slightly, hopefully be more streamlined as more commercial flights have happened. So wow, kind of wild, right? Believe it or not, everything I covered in this video is pretty much the tip of the iceberg for getting an FAA approval to carry a crew on board your ship. If you want to dig deeper, I left some links to the documents in the description below. Holler at me on Twitter if you have any further questions about this. I'd be happy to answer whatever I can. I really want to thank my patrons for their continued support. I wouldn't be here without you all, and I really appreciate your feedback on scripts. You guys are really smart. If you want to help support the channel, consider buying a shirt at ineedmore.space slash shop. Helps me make more educational videos like this one. Anyways, I hope you consider subscribing. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you guys later. Bye.